Good morning again. I know some of you have heard about uh, new recommendations from CDC, and uh, they're encouraging and that it looks like things are opening up again. You might be wondering when we will be announcing changes for how we gather. A couple things about that is, uh, first of all, uh, New York is actually processing that information, so uh, New York State and uh, Monroe County Health Departments will uh, tell us what the options are for religious gatherings, so we're looking forward to seeing those. Secondly is, uh, we know that as we come back, there's going to be, um, what we want to do is provide options for people, so there'll be options for people who are fully vaccinated, and there'll be options for people who may not be vaccinated or may not be comfortable meeting without social distancing and uh, without masks. And so we're gonna uh, do our best to provide options for that. And uh, our goal is to actually make sure that when we come here, our focus can be on Jesus. Um, there's a lot of ways that we can lose sight of what he wants to do in our lives because of what's going on around us. And so uh, we're very, we're looking forward uh, how many, it would be okay with you if we got back to some kind of normal. Would that be all right? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, the series is There is an Eye in Worship. And uh, if you're familiar with the expression, uh, there's a, a saying that says there is no eye in team. It, it calls out the idea that an individual is not more important than the team. The team has to work together, and this is usually a sports analogy. But there is an eye in worship that while we do work together, we have an individual contribution to make in our connection to and conversation with God. And it requires a certain kind of humility, quite honestly, on our part, to assume that we're not exempt either from a physical expression or the truth that may challenge some of our assumptions. Because God is looking. This is what surprises us, is that worship is about God looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So we're going to look at two passages today. The first is from Psalm 86, beginning in verse 11. And it says, teach me your way. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. David didn't write all 150 psalms that we have contained in Scripture, but he wrote a lot of them, and he actually wrote this one. And he's telling us something, that there is... there even though he is at epic levels of worship, he still thinks that God has things to teach him. Let's just check this morning. How many assume there's still some things that God could teach you? Yeah, that's great. So we're all in that, that boat together, right? Now, the challenge is, is that when we come to worship, we have ways that we prefer, but we're asking God to teach us his way, because when that happens, we, a, a couple of things start into motion. One is we find ourselves relying on him. That's a big deal. Secondly, is that what we experience in God is rather remarkable, and our heart becomes undivided. Uh, it, is, it is a very different way to live when you have an undivided heart. So we're going to use this concept about God teaching us his way and about an undivided heart by looking at what is the most offensive story in all of Scripture. I don't know anyone who likes it. It's offensive to the modern mind. It's quite honestly offensive to most believers. It is very difficult to understand, very difficult to explain, and there are lots of preachers who would actually prefer this story didn't show up in Scripture, and yet it did. By the way, it's the kind of thing that if people were responsible for trying to control popular opinion, they'd have left this story out. And so 
we are called to engage in a kind of worship that is wholehearted. So what does this look like? We're gonna use a, 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 probably one of the most difficult stories in all of scripture to examine this, and it's found in Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, God's being really specific here, isn't he? And go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey and took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, this is a lot of walking and, and time for internal processing. What is going on in the mind and the heart of Abraham in this three-day journey? He looked up and he saw the place in the distance and he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then, don't miss this, we will come back to you. We will worship and we will come back. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And when they reached the place God told him about, Abraham built an altar there. He arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. In Hebrew, the, that name is Jehovah Jireh. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And God told Abraham to go to the land of Moriah and to offer Isaac as a burnt offering on the mountain, he would tell him. Um, there are, unfortunately, many murders every year in our country. And on rare occasion, there are some people who will make the claim that they were actually being obedient to what God told them to do that God told them to take someone else's life. And they actually heard a voice, and now they're following in obedience. They can't escape the reality of that voice. It only gets louder and worse until they follow through in obedience. And it's a kind of psychotic break that it's very difficult to explain and very difficult to work with the collateral damage that comes out of it. And there's a lot of people that when they look at a story like this, that's what they think is happening. Abraham just had a breakdown here. He's hearing voices and, and he's, he's just, he's gonna kill his son. 
And, and a fair question to ask is, how do we know that's not what's going on? How do we know some kind of religious individual didn't try to clean this up? And there are clues throughout the story that give us very important information that this is not Abraham breaking down. And this, by the way, is not Abraham taking a leap of faith because that's how it's often described. Just God's going to call you to do something that you've, you can't imagine. And, 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 and even though you have no experience and, and, and no history, just, just go for it and see what God does. And that's the, that's the evidence or that's the definition of, of trusting God. Neither of those things are happening in this story. The voice did not say, get up and go into Isaac's tent and kill him in his sleep. That's not what's going on here. There's something much deeper happening. And it's so hard for us to wrap our minds around because we are offended at the story. And what I will tell you is modern man is the most easily offended humans in our entire history. Anything, everything offends us. It doesn't take much. If you're one fry short of a Happy Meal, your whole day is ruined. It's just not right. They put cheese on my burger and I actually said no cheese. I was specific. I took the initiative. I took time. They got it wrong. How hard is it? We're offended. Uh, someone runs for a political office. We're offended with them. Somebody doesn't run for political office that we would prefer. We're offended about that. Almost everything we hear on media and in social media has the capacity to offend us. But there's something truly remarkable about the offense that we experience when God says something we don't like. In this world, we tend to argue with people who offend us. In spiritual world, we tend to distance ourselves when God offends us. And I just have to warn you up front, there's no way you can read through Scripture and not be offended by God. He doesn't think like we think. He challenges things in us. So the, the, uh, a really interesting initial truth here is that we don't have to go to a new place to worship in order to go to a new place in worship. That it's not about location. There's a reason God asked, there's actually multiple reasons God asked Abraham to make this three-day journey, but it's, it's not about a location. It's about something that's going on in his heart. He's going to process this information for, for three days while he walks. So, well, I just need to, to find a new place to worship. God wants to bring you to a new place in worship. It doesn't matter where you are. How many are grateful for that? God can do a new thing. So God leads us to places that will challenge some of our motives, certainly examine some of our attitudes. It will test what we rely on. God doesn't prohibit like going back to the well-worn paths of things that we've enjoyed in worship. Uh, we all have our favorite songs in worship. We have our favorite songs in the world. We have our, our favorite approaches and styles in worship. That's human nature. And, and whatever that style is, it's called tradition. Tradition isn't about a more conservative approach. Tradition is about frequency and identity. This is what I like to do more often, and this is how I see myself. And everyone has traditions. Families have traditions. Institutions have traditions. Nations have traditions. Churches have traditions. And I've seen some churches that not us. We don't have any traditions. We kill traditions in this place. Yes, that's their tradition. <laughs> that's what they do. And, and it's hard. When, once, you, once you climb into that boat, that's a really hard place to be because now you have to come up with something completely original every single Sunday. And that's harder than it sounds. Traditions retell the stories in a communal way. It reminds us of things that God has done or things that other people have done in our lives. That's why we do it. But here's the challenge, is that sometimes when we get comfortable with our traditions, we wind up believing that there really isn't anything more to learn. Teach me your way. Not just remind me of something that happened to me along the way. God's not opposed to us revisiting in our memories, retelling the stories of his workings in our lives and celebrating that with other people. But that's not all there is to our spiritual life. 
Your best day in your walk with God is not behind you. But when we get locked in to just constantly going back to what we're most familiar with, vibrant worship can take a hit. And we can wind up just going through the motions. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. There's something new to learn. With God, there are new things that he wants to teach us. New expressions in worship can help us experience new dimensions of God's goodness. There's a part of my heart that hungers for more of God, not just a, rem not just a memory of God. We need more of God. We need to know more of his spirit and his ways. So God is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Worship leads us to surrender to God's purpose and his process. God is doing something, and this is going to be very difficult for Abraham, but he's going along with his purpose and his process. Abraham believed that Isaac, his son, was a miracle gift from God. He knew that was true. We talked a little bit about that story last week. Abraham was tested to see what was going to determine his decisions in life and the direction of his life. Is he still going to be obedient to God or does everything now revolve around the gift that God gave him? Question for you. I'd like you to think about it seriously. Does God have any right to ask you to give up anything you love? Or is your version of spirituality one that God only gives you more of what you already like? This is where faith stops being a child's game. And there's nothing else in our society that drives these kinds of concepts as deep into our heart. We're so easily distracted. Technically, no one is bored anymore. We don't have to be. I can just pull out a smart device and keep myself content regardless of what else is going on. David says, I don't want to withhold anything from you. I want to worship you with an undivided heart that I may fear your name. And this is one of the things that really frustrates me about how people think about God. Some people think of God as this cosmic bully who just wants everyone to fear and tremble when even his name is mentioned, like when the hyenas in The Lion King say the word Mufasa, and they go, ooh, you know, just kind of like that. And you, you say the word God, just, ooh. And that's not what God is after. And by, by the way, that's not what that word means. Um, let, let me see. Anybody here, parents of children that have made it into their teens? Okay. Then there's something that you are absolutely familiar with. Happens in every house. Doesn't matter how dedicated a parent you are or how good your kids are. There's going to come a point at which you have given direction to your child. They know exactly what is expected. And yet when they are with their friends, there's another option available to them. And in that moment, they choose the option with their friends. And parents typically ask why questions. Why would you do that? And uh, honestly, the child hasn't processed that out all that rationally. They're kind of responding to something in the moment. What they're responding to has to do with this idea of fear. They're more concerned about what their friends think than what their parents think based on this action. I don't want my friends to think less of me, therefore I will go along with this, and then I hope my parents, who have proven that they love me and will take care of me, will understand. That's the concept of fear. Who are you more concerned about disappointing in life? And for lots of us, because God is so loving and has cared for us so much, we'll just disappoint him. But this idea of respecting his desires and wishes and direction in our life. That's what it's about. So God wants to reveal his incredible life to us through wholehearted worship. Like we, there's some things we can't understand or comprehend if our worship is, is, is segmented and, and um, kind of torn apart a little bit. 
So worship ceases to be, when you come to God in wholehearted worship, it ceases to be an obligation. It starts turning into an opportunity. This is a story about a man in his 90s and a woman in her 80s having faith that they could make a baby. That's faith. This is a story about a man and a woman who are asked to sacrifice something that God had given them. That takes faith. And by the way, I don't know anybody in this room who would want to start parenting in their 80s or 90s. How many would agree? That would take God giving you a direct order. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or sacrificing something that he's given to us. It is our nature to protect ourselves and avoid things in life that could reveal the most about God. If we only do what we want, we're going to have a limited knowledge about God and a shallow experience with him. There are some things we only learn about God in a season of testing and sacrifice. We can read important words of truth, but that doesn't mean we've walked in them. That's where the challenge lies. Awareness of God is not all there is to faith. Agreeing with God is not all there is to faith. There's actions. There's ways that we live that out. The Bible says this, faith without works is dead. So God demands things that are dear to us. Why does he do that? It is not because he needs them. It's because we need to be free from the control of them. It is amazing, once we strongly desire something, how that thing can begin to exercise serious control of our life. After the mountain, Abraham can truly love his son. If you've made it this late into life and you've got one child, and uh, that was a miracle, and you don't think there's going to be any others, you can put a lot of pressure on that kid. And uh, some of you are here this morning and you're going, yeah, my parents weren't that old and I wasn't an only child and they put more pressure than that on me. Like, we can do that. It is very easy to over-discipline a child trying to create perfection. It is very easy to overreact when something has gone wrong and they've disappointed us. And that, that's proof that our love is disordered. It, there's, there's something missing, and what is missing is the ultimate love to God. It's also true that we could under-discipline a child because our fear is that we might displease them and it would sacrifice that relationship that we could have with them. We can overindulge them just simply because we constantly feel afraid and we feel guilty. And if we make God anything other than first place in our life, what we wind up doing is putting pressure for, on someone or something else to be God in our life. Our children can't be our gods. Our parents can't be our gods. Our spouses cannot be our gods. They're not built for it. They can't take the pressure of it. They will be destroyed under it. But once you allow God to be God in your life, it's amazing how much better we can love everyone else in our life. It's absent of that pressure. It's an absolute phenomenal thing. So God wants us to take away, God wants to take away our fear that he does not have our best interest at heart. In living worship, we draw near to the living God and we discern his heart. Now, Abraham could have refused this request. And in doing so, he might well have lost the very thing he wanted to protect. Abraham gained something he could not have imagined. He actually gained God himself. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. Cutting edge worship is not about what's trendy. This story gives us insights. It's about cutting away the things that we cling to and depend on apart from God. It's about cutting through the excuses that we make to disengage. It's about cutting off the illusion that we know all there is to know about God and his ways. God is not boring. And if we are bored with him, 
it is because we are not learning his ways. We've settled for something in our past. And we're just repeating something we learned along the way. God has come to instruct us, to teach us in worship. And I know, you're, like, there's some direction that comes. We, we try not to be, manip, uh, to manipulate people or coerce people into anything. We invite people to participate in things. And what I know is, it doesn't matter how often or what the options are. There's always something inside of us that goes, yeah, I don't have to do that. I, I already know that. Or, I don't feel like doing that today. Because the truth about me is, my life sucks right now. There's nothing going my way. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I'm disappointed. I feel like when I pray, God doesn't hear me. So if he doesn't hear me when I pray, I'm not going to say anything in worship. There's a, a couple of people that I follow on, well, I follow a lot of people on social media, but there's a couple of people whose stories right now are capturing my attention. And it has to do with uh, their long-term struggle with infertility, and now they have a baby. And uh, watching the pure joy on their faces and the pictures that they post and the things that they say. And for that person to come into a room like this, how easy do you think worship would be today? Hands raised, heart abandoned, just voice all out, holding the very life that God gave them. But what about the person who is still struggling with infertility? Do they have nothing to say to the God of heaven and earth? And with tears that they may be choking back, and with a voice that quivers under their emotion, and with hands that feel incredibly heavy as they lift them, they raise their hands in worship. And are we really going to believe for one minute that that worship is any less? any less than the one who's celebrating what God has done, because there's still something in that person's heart who's willing to believe that somewhere in me is a promise, and some way God's going to make it true. Some way. So our worship, our worship is not based on what's going on around us. God wants to teach us His way so that we learn to rely on him. Abraham knew it. I don't know how he knew it. He had a long history of walking with God. He's further down this faith journey than you and I are. And as he's going for three days, he's looking. God's going to provide. When he's going to make the sacrifice, he tells the servants, we are coming back. God will provide. I don't know how. And even to the moment that his son is bound and laying on the altar and he reaches out to take the knife, all the pictures I've seen of this are of Abraham in a kill position right over his son like this. And, and I don't actually think it was like that. I think he was just reaching and, and that was enough. That was enough. And God said, you're not to hurt your son. Now I know. And immediately there's a provision. I wonder what it is you need today that you could provide, you could, God could provide for you if you're willing to approach him with undivided, wholehearted worship. That's how I'd like us to close our service today. Let's all stand to our feet. I'm gonna ask you, raise your hands, raise your voice. Let's come to God, not because our life is good, or maybe it is, but because he is good and he is here.